Good morning. I bet it was a wonderful day and some wonderful things happened the day you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. In the process of finding and building a relationship with Jesus Christ, a wonderful thing happened certainly to each of us. And it may have happened instantaneously or it may have happened along the process of growing up in the church. Not only did you find salvation and something very personal, you found something that would be absolutely necessary to your growing in your faith and something that would always be there to help you stay grounded. The thing that happened was that you found something all of us desire beyond a relationship with Christ, and that is community, true community. When we were saved, we became part of something bigger than us. We became part of the church. We became part of the big, the big church, the big C church, and also the part of a local church, maybe even Lehman. A group of people who believe what you believe and who try to act according to those beliefs. A place where you are unconditionally loved and embraced by the rest. Community is a truly wonderful thing. A community is defined as a unified body of individuals with common character and common interests who share joint ownership and participation in something. In addition to the scriptures that Chuck read for you, there's also another one for us to understand and to hear today from Acts chapter 2, where true biblical community is modeled. In verse 42, it says, speaking of the first church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. All believers were together and had everything in common. This is really a picture of authentic community. Preaching about this topic a number of years ago, I used a quote from a source I can no longer identify, but it speaks of the importance of community and more importantly, of the struggle there is to find real, authentic community. It says this, wherever it still exists, the concept of community is under siege. In order to protect itself, society comes up with institutions devised to hold the social fabric together, government, business, schools, technology, capitalism, socialism, market economics, the welfare state, and a dozen ideologies that claim the power to build community. But a sentiment of fatigue and despair prevails. The problems are becoming more complex, the conflicts more inextricable, and the ideals of community more elusive than ever. I wonder if you agree generally or disagree with that particular statement. Is community a hard thing to find in the areas that I mentioned? And if community is difficult to find, then what is the solution to not finding community in these areas? Well, the quote continues. In the midst of this turmoil, Christians sense that the church holds the potential to provide solutions. We believe in a God who moves redemptively in our lives and who, therefore, has the power to effect change in the world. Whereas the essential definition of the church is to be the community of oneness that unites God's people, the church has to rediscover its own basic identity as community. So the solution is the church. It's not that we can't find some redeeming qualities in these other areas where community might be found, but generally they do not last. One of the most beautiful things that came out of Jesus' mouth and heart had to do with the church. You'll remember these words spoken to Peter after Peter finally says something intelligent to Jesus for a change. In Matthew 16, 18, 
Jesus responds to Peter, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. I think Jesus wanted to build not a school, not a government, not a club, not a community soccer league, or a network of support groups, but rather he wanted to build the church. Why? Because there's no other institution that can do what the church can do when it's properly functioning as the community. When churches understand that before anything else they are, and before anything else they do, even if it's really good stuff that makes an infinitely world, an infinitely better place in the world, when they understand that they are first and foremost the only truly God-inspired form of community that can be found, those churches have found their greatest mission and vision of all. The gates of hell can and do prevail against school systems and governments, but try as Satan might, and he does, authentic community, the church, will always win the day. So the question needs to be asked. What are the marks of true community? What are the marks of a church against which the gates of hell cannot prevail? That's what Jesus said. Colossians 3 lists them. We could probably spend a Sunday on each of those. We won't do that. But right now it's enough to simply identify the fact that these are the marks and the characteristics of a holy people as Paul mentions in verse 12, as he begins that verse, he says, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, clothe yourselves with, and then he goes on with the list. In other words, these are the characteristics we ought to show as true community. These are the kinds of clothes we are to wear. Here's a quick list and a definition of each. These are the clothes of community. The first is mercy, to enter into someone else's pain and to bear it with them. Kindness, to genuinely care for another. Humility, to put someone else's interests before your own. Gentleness, to allow someone to save face. Patience, to give another some time. Graciousness, to give a little leeway and flexibility for another's faults. Forgiveness, to let it go, to not hold a grudge against someone anymore. Love, to unconditionally sacrifice for another. Peace, to rest in Jesus. And finally, thankfulness, to show your appreciation. That's a lot of clothes to wear. That's a lot that he's asking us to keep on. But as the holy community of God's people, you wear a lot so that when you are asked to give the shirt off your back, you've got plenty more to give away than just the shirt. These are the marks of how we are to deal with one another. So the question is, how are you doing? How are you doing wearing those clothes and those marks of true community? Better yet, how are we doing as a church? For sure, the more we exhibit these behaviors, the more we breathe in and exhale out community. Now, we decided that the sermon series was called Got Questions, Get Answers, and the question this morning that is posed to us is why should I go to church? And perhaps I'm preaching to the choir because you're already sitting here, but let's just remind ourselves why that's important. It should be said that the community is not the same without you. We have already answered that the church is the only place where God-inspired community takes place, God-inspired community. Without the gifts of others in the body, 
the community is less than what it could be. The church needs you. I've said that before, but it's important to know the church needs everybody. You should go to church because the church needs you and you need the church. It works both ways. The church provides true community even as the individual is a part of it. Each of us is unique in what we have to offer. Once again, Acts 2 says that the people shared all they had, and that included the gifts of talent and abilities that come along with every person who is part of the community. In the book, Fling Open the Doors, Giving the Church Away to the Community, author Paul Nixon writes about seven marks of an intensely community-oriented church. I'd like to share with you the first three. These kinds of churches will be marked by, one, a deeply felt sense of mission that compels them to reach out and make disciples. Two, a view of their physical facilities as community centers for the people they serve. And three, an intense concern for connecting with the unchurched public, but never at the price of compromising the core of the faith as they understand it. Let's take a quick look at number three. Speaking of that, we need to ask ourselves the question of whether we do have an intense concern with the unchurched public, because the community is not just about those that are already inside the church, but it's also about those who should be inside the church as well. Did you know that at the end of 2020, the population of Hatboro itself, not even the surrounding communities, is 8,238 people? Surely there are some who are not churched. Surely there are some in this area who feel isolated and lonely wondering if there's more to life than just living it out for themselves. Surely there are those who are craving a group of people who will show mercy and kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, graciousness, forgiveness, love, peace, and thankfulness. They may try to look toward other ways of creating community but the church is the only entity that can provide the community they are truly seeking. We are the ones to provide a place where those who are seeking can find what they are truly looking for. In just a few moments, we will be celebrating communion. This is a good example of what it means to be the blessed community of God's people and speaks to the literal breaking of the bread identified in Acts 2. When we join together in communion, we remember God's action on our behalf, bringing us together by the sacrifice of Christ, in whom we find our commonality. Let's keep looking to bring us into and keep us in community with one another, and always remind us to extend that community to all who will come. God has already given us the blessing of community. He has given us each other. Let us be that blessing of community to others for Christ's sake and for theirs. Amen.